we've talked a lot about uh, you know pipelines and, and diversifying the pool of faculty, uh, but clearly those of us that are offering professional master's degree programs are also kind of concerned about that group of professionals. Uh, we've had some discussion of that here, uh, but I think we may want to think a little bit about you know whether there's some differences in those two pools or are they complements or they substitutes. Uh, and uh, uh, but without further ado, let me just turn it over to the floor. Yes. Jody. Jody Stanford from the University of Minnesota. I just want to thank the NDRC and the USDA's perspective because I think you illustrated something that Eric said, which is we we really strongly believe that cultural competency is an essential professional competency in public policy analysis and management. And so to do the work in these agencies, you need to know how to deal with diverse people and thrive. And that the more we embed that in all of the work we do on the school side, the more the agencies that are where our products go to work are going to be able to carry out the work in this diverse world. And it's, it's for people who don't get the moral and the kind of social justice equity, it's just good business sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just make that comment because I think we really are past an era where this can even be a debate. We have to be creating students who understand deeply how to do this work. Yes. Eric, I really want to thank you for bringing up uh, the Somali students that live near your campus and are beginning to engage in higher education there. I think many of us live in communities that have um, high levels of, one, uh, of first generation or 1.5 generation immigrants and uh, there's an opportunity to enrich cultural competence through their participation in the program, but there's also an obligation on our part to have the sensitivity to the communities and working in the communities that um, may be new to some institutions, um, just as the demographics are changing nationally. So I, I appreciate what you bringing that up. Thank you. I, I, it does go both ways, and we have a, a, a couple of few programs that are actually in the Cedar Riverside community, the, um, um, and they, they face their challenges in terms of the cultural competence of of, um, of the representatives of the Humphrey School engaging in the community. But that's all part of the that's all part of the package. Um, yeah, I mean, I this dawn the MBA program as a, as a vehicle to try to achieve some of what Sam was talking about on the community college side, um, it, it dawned on me, at, at, frankly, at the APSIA meeting, when my colleagues at that meeting kept talking about their one-year master's programs as revenue generators <laughs> to bring in these people. And I'm thinking, that's not our MBA program. Um, and and it, it's really an interesting, it's an interesting model that we can think about expanding. So just on the point of cultural competency, I want to draw that everyone's attention, a conference you may not know about called the White Privilege Conference, mm -hmm. which is actually happening next week. I, I'm, uh, it's, a, it's a place to really learn deeply about issues of social justice um, and to um, think about how to bring it into the educational process. And again, Seattle next week. Um, I was reminded because Derek Hamilton, who was mentioned in the last panel, uh, has met, has having um, uh, uh, been a postdoc in Michigan and has been um, Probably the field is giving one of the keynote speeches. Some of you may know Derek. Um, he's uh, on the faculty at the Milano School, the new school where I'm the associate dean at the Milano School. So if you want to learn about deep uh, diversity, you might check out my privilege .com. Uh Marie Chevrier, Rutgers Camden. Um, I both of these last two comments I think are are uh, are, are really important, and once again, I thank the whole panel. Eric, I think that one of your points um, has particular salience, which is um, your commitment and the commitment of the white faculty to diversity. Because um, I think there are a couple of things that are really important about that. As um, a woman, when I was an assistant professor, there really weren't very many women. And so I got called on to be on this committee and on that committee. Susan, you know, I'm sure you were on 50 hiring committees because, <laughs> you know, where can we find a woman? Where can we? Oh, two for one. Um, uh, and we need to protect our um, junior faculty so that they don't get bur overly burdened with service that is not valued at tenure time as much um, as um, teaching and research. And um, I think there's a, there's a model that, um, uh, with the gay community that it, um, or the LGBT community that it's really useful, which is the gay-straight alliance idea. 
that we need to cultivate allies that are not part of the underrepresented or minority groups to support the goals of um, diversity. So that's um, that's my comment. Me? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Connecting to that, I, I noted, I was really impressed when you said, John, that there was a code to charge the time you spent doing mentoring. And I think, Eric, I heard you mention something about looking at evaluations of teaching and thinking about how to incorporate this. And I wonder if the panel would hold it, talk about how do you reward or build in to your systems uh, accountability for doing this kind of work? I'd say the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation should give $25,000 to the winner of the NASPA Diversity Award. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because then you don't, in the second year, there aren't enough schools to, to, to compete. And I can tell you right now, if you offer $25,000 to the winner, you'll have a bunch of schools compete. And if they compete, then they got to think about, okay, what actually are we doing? So, you know, that, that's my gut reaction. I don't know if we're the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. <laughs> but that would be a modest suggestion. 25000 isn't a lot of money, and, um, and I think it would make a difference. So my point is incentives make a huge difference. Um, and, and the only other comment I'll make in response to the, the early one is the most active members of our faculty, it, it's a generational issue. Um, Non-minority faculty at the Humphrey School are deeply engaged and really serious about this, but it's but they're mostly much younger. We have, thankfully in our school, we have some at the many at the associate professor level and a couple at the professor level. So they so the assistant professors have that support and validation. But that's an issue. Um, uh, that, that's an issue. Hopefully, it's an issue that will go away over time. But it is an issue. So uh, I'll say it, uh, at MDRC, a, a couple of things. So I mentioned there's a charge code for mentoring. There's also a charge code that the Diversity Council can use. And that's part of their profile. They, if you're on the Diversity Council, 10% of your time is dedicated to the work of the mm -hmm. Diversity Council. So again, really recognizing this is an important part of your role as a staff person at MDRC. Um, the other thing that we, that, we, that we do is, as part of our performance management system and annual reviews, there are competencies around inclusiveness and um, kind of uh, commitment to uh, culture, uh, to, to corporate initiatives and things like that, to make sure that that is recognized and valued as part of your annual review. And I'll also say at USDA, we have um, our performance review is somewhat like tenure, but not quite like tenure <laughs> um, for our researchers. But we do have the civil rights competency that's part of it. Um, I never know how much it's weighted, and I, you know, I'd be interested, that's something I'm gonna follow up with my agency about, it's something I'm hearing. Um, I do hear from people that have mentored some of our students that it is a time burden, and they feel like they haven't had time to do research, and they're not sure how it's rewarded, so I think that's something we could probably improve on. And I just wanted to mention in response to that, and this follows up to the comments, I think the city of Seattle is really doing some remarkable work in this yes. area through their race and social justice initiative and a lot of the things that they're doing in terms of just building into the process. One thing I know is that there's a budget filter, um, a race and social justice budget filter that um, must be completed for any request for dollars. And so looking to see what that request is and how that's gonna, have, what impact that's gonna have from an equity perspective is important. So I would just, I mean, they've got a lot of resources related to performance indicators um, related to diversity and equity. Back row, had your hand up earlier. Uh, no, very back row. No, not you? Oh, okay. Um, then, again, I think people had uh, you there, then you. <laughs> yes, you. Hi, um, my name is Nicole Rochelle, and I'm currently at Virginia Tech, but next year I will be at John Jay. Um, I think these policies and practices aimed at enacting a more diverse workforce were um, MPA, PhD program um, are really, you know, fantastic and admirable. But I keep returning to this more fundamental question of, um, you know, the normative question of how diversity should be defined and the actual discourse surrounding diversity itself and the challenges associated um, with just the naming and the inclusive piece of the definition of diversity. <coughs> So I was hoping that the panelists could maybe speak to that um, challenge a bit. Well, 
I think uh, in terms of many of our objectives, uh, and I'm just, you know, different people will have different views on this, but, but, but in my view, um, uh, uh, a critical component of diversity uh, has to deal with um, disenfranchisement. And, um, and, um, and, and, if, and if you pretend that's not <coughs> at the center of the equation, then you make your job a lot easier. But I think you miss what is really uh, a, 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 a critical, if not the critical dimension. And I, that's been my view since the day I got to Humphrey School. It's very nice to have lots of different people from lots of different places. Um, but, but if it doesn't, if it, I think if it, you don't include the element of, of, um, of marginalization and disenfranchisement, then you're not recognizing the challenge. And so for me, I think that's got to, for my purposes, that's got to be central. Any other guys? I, I would say I agree with that. Um, but one, one thing that we've been thinking about a lot at MBRC, and I think we've tried to, to, to move in, is I do think, um, you know, diversity is very <coughs> important. But, you know, MBRC for a, a long time had, you know, a reputation of, you know, we only hire certain kinds of PhDs from certain schools. And I think there was a recognition that if we're committed to diversity, we need to think more broadly about where we, you know, approach, uh, where we where we try to recruit from to make sure that, um, you know, we, we are we're, we're casting as wide a net as possible. And I think um, it's you know, it's been slow, um, and uh, and but but I think it's happening, and, and we are trying to cast a wider net so that we do tap beyond the typical you know Princeton, Harvard, Yale um, types of schools and recognize there's a lot of really talented uh, folks with great skills out there beyond, beyond those particular programs. So I agree with my thing that uh, diversity uh, is to be explicitly defined, that the leader needs to find it, and the leader here has defined it in the context where Humphrey is dealing with marginalization and disenfranchisement. And I appreciate the fact that I'm at a university where my you know, immediate supervisor specifically acknowledges that race and ethnicity is part of the definition of diversity. The problem is that we live in a world where diversity is not well defined and where many people want, many people who are opponents to what used to be called affirmative action, want to define diversity in terms of intellectual diversity, in terms of uh, ideological diversity. And the whole we have built for ourselves rests in part on the Michigan Supreme Court case where we tried to make the case for diversity based on cognitive function. And if you want to make it on cognitive function, you've got to try to draw a line. You've got to connect the dots between what's the relationship between disenfranchisement and marginalization and cognitive function. Because the conservatives are going to say, well, wait a minute, if by cognitive function it means problem solving, you know, uh, analytic ability, you know, quantitative ability, what does that have to do with race? What does that have to do with ethnicity? What does that have to do with this event? So I'm just really lucky to be at a university where there's kind of an explicit definition of diversity, but we're living in a world where most institutions say diversity, but don't define it. Sean, and with you. <laughs> Sean, at the University of Michigan. I just have a question, and I'm uh, kind of connecting back to Sam's comment, and I thank everyone for the comment as well. Uh, Michelle, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, and, and, uh, how, do you, how do you, or how does um, the FDA in its hiring process with a series of questions that it does ask define the benefit of diversity? That's a good question. I don't think it's explicitly in it. It's usually qualifications, um, such as, you know, tell us your um, statistical background or e e econometric background. Um, I doubt that it is specifically one of the questions. Because I was asking that, because no. I think that's one of the issues about being someone undefined. No, it's, and it's not just you. Yeah, especially since it's in one of our competencies. Right. You <laughs> might think it would be part of it. <laughs> if the process is, is such that HR handles it, they need yeah. some questions that was part of their process for evaluating the criteria for selecting the job. Yeah. And then the last thing I just want to ask you related to your program, and this is the, this is the broad issue, 
You're right. You have a primary goal of hiring PhDs, but your, your pipeline program is BAs. So I think the, the solution seems kind of right Yeah, front. no, I think that's right. <laughs> uh, and maybe that might be part of the reason why they're broadening it up to other universities. Is you know, Most of the 1890 schools don't offer MA or PhD level courses. So that might be one reason why we particularly are doing it within USDA, which has this broader program. Um, so I'll have to go get back. On the contrary, that. that most minority research institutions grant most of the PhDs to look for African Americans in the country. But are, okay. Yeah, no, I don't know if the, I don't know about the 1890s one, but that's, that's good. So Michelle, I want to really thank you for being very transparent about the history of the Department of Agriculture, which is not favorable to diversity and and. You are not the only government organization, and there are certainly a sufficient number of universities who have issues like this. I'm uh, wondering if you can give us any insight into, in the hiring interaction process, how do you, how do you address those kinds of issues to communicate to uh, uh, a candidate of color or or someone of a different sexual orientation or whatever, how do you communicate to them that that's, not, that's who we were, that's not who we are today? You know, since I'm not the manager, I don't know the answer to that question, but um, I think you know that history is with us and I think most people at USC are aware of it and, and it's, it's gonna stay with us for a long time. With the Shirley Sherrod episode two years ago, it was a well and mm -hmm. just crazy. And so I think everyone at the institution is aware of it. Um, how they handle it, I'm not sure. And I think it's going to be something we're going to have. And it's one of the reasons the 1890 Scholars Program is there. Um, but I will definitely go back and talk to my. And I'd just like to follow up by, by saying that uh, I am from UMass Boston. And one of the things that the governor in Massachusetts has done is establish a cabinet level position uh, focused on diversity. But it's not called that. It's called the Office of Access and Opportunity. And so I think there is this whole labeling issue. Is it affirmative action? Is it quotas? Is it diversity? Is it social equity? Is it whatever? That everybody has to kind of wrestle around. And because we're not doing a good job of defining it, it, it becomes more challenging. But I, uh, you know, I'm happy to be in a state now that has that recognition at that level. So, you know, I, I think that different governmental levels are dealing with this in different ways. Yeah, uh, Lee Badger from UMass Amherst. Um, I loved hearing about what all you guys are doing, and um, and it's clear there's a commitment that's kind of been internalized. But I'm wondering about, and we've touched on this to some extent. Why did you go there, right? So, I mean, I can think about lots of reasons why an institution might decide to make that commitment. You know, maybe it's because there's a funder who says we'll give you funding to support this, but maybe it's because you have, you know, grad students who are uh, doing what I did when I was a grad student. We pick it in our department's office to say, why aren't you doing more in terms of faculty hiring and, and making it more diverse? So, I mean, there's lots of different things that, that could be done, and so I guess I'm wondering about what are what are strategies that maybe those who are now professors could do, <laughs> instead of now that we're not grad students anymore. But, um, and then how do we get some of that, those incentives uh, institutionalized maybe in other places? You know, so the NASBA accreditation standards is sort of one place where you might see that. And I don't know if that was important or not, but you know, so what, what was important in getting your institutions to do this? For me? Um, I, I did it because I think it's the right thing to do. Sorry, I'm not. I don't have a more complicated answer for you. But so that's the it. In there are plenty of reasons for me not to, for uh -huh. why I shouldn't do it. it. Would make my life a lot easier. I can give give lip service to it. The institution. There are enough institutional incentives moving in the other direction that you have plenty of options for going that other route. Um, no, I, I, I. It just it struck me as it's. The, I think it's the right thing to do. And I when I wake up in the morning, I like to. You know, you like to think well of yourself, uh, um, and but I, I, I want to use your question to. to talk, you know, I, I, I was a little flip when I said dis disenfranchised. Uh, disenfranchised. What does that mean from my perspective? And I, I think any dean who sits for two hours 
with all of your, with whatever your students of color organization is. You won't have to have this prolonged discussion of whether it's disenfranchisement or something else. Because what it is, is um, it's an experience that your, your, your communities of color have in your institution in which their personal experiences somehow are, are, are it, it is communicated that those personal experiences, life experience and otherwise, are somehow less vital, um, less valid, um, less compelling, less relevant. Um, and as a result of, the, of those broad perceptions within an institution or within society, that, though, that community of people have greater obstacles to achieve success as we define it. That's what disenfranchisement is. And if you don't believe that it exists, then you're not, you're not talking to your communities of color. You're just not, because you don't need, you don't need uh, as, as wonderful as the studies that Sam Myers and others do on this, you don't need the study. You, you, know, you, you, you just need to sit with these, with these students and talk about what their experiences are in the broader culture. And, and 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 you come you know you come to that conclusion. What the remedies are? That's a that's a different set of conversations. But if you don't think there's disenfranchisement there, then you don't know your students. I'd just like to follow up on, on both of the comments. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. So the first, I think about you know how is diversity defined, and I completely agree with uh, what Eric said about it being uh, institutionally defined and thinking about the notion of uh, disenfranchisement and who's been excluded. So specific to the case, I think um, Nicole mentioned she's from Virginia Tech. If we look at Virginia Tech, okay, it was founded in 1872. The first African-American graduate of Virginia Tech, was, uh, first student to enter was Irvin Pedro in 1953. He did not finish, he did not live on campus. Um, and the first graduate of Virginia Tech, African-American, was Charlie Yates um, in 1958. So if Virginia Tech is looking at his history in terms of diversity, it seems to me it would look at its own diversity narrative and see, okay, from 1872 to 1953, there were no African-American students, so obviously a priority at Virginia Tech needs to be around African-American um, students. So I think that goes back and ties back to knowing your institution's history and being able to build upon that in your active diversity plan. And then on the other question in terms of why people do it, and I completely agree, if we look across a broad spectrum of cases, typically it's a leadership issue in terms of where we see sustained change. Um, so if you can have leadership from the top, that's better. But there's typically four reasons why folks engage in that work. One is the moral issue, the moral reason. Uh, second is the economic case. So, you know, the bottom line, it improves the bottom line. We see that in a lot of um, private sector industries. The legal case, um, because you have to, um, there's a legal uh, case that is requiring you, or political action, because there have been changes or uh, political pressures in order to do it. So typically, it's one of those four areas for why institutions do that work. And we have just one more. You'll be the last one. Okay. Uh, for the Harvard <coughs> School, how do you measure the outcome of your action? I'll, I'll tell you when they finish this class. <laughs> no, that, that's the God, That's the that's the truth. I mean, where it's a great question because if you if you see the the, the action plan, it's um, there are two uh, there are two elements that are distinctive. Number one, uh, the the action items are in the dozens, if not hundreds. Um, so how do we establish what those? And <clears throat> second, many of those objectives are not easily measurable. So we're actually involved in an effort right now to define, you know, to identify uh, metrics uh, for success. And I would say that um, that different sets of objectives um, uh, um, align themselves with different kinds of metrics. And and I, I think at the end of the day, it's not all about effort. Um, as several people have said, you know, um, uh, you, you need to see results. Um, do you have a higher percent, much higher percentage of faculty of color, of students of color? I mean, there are some bottom line, you know, uh, um, uh, answers. But the short answer to your question is, we're working through that right now. Well, uh, again, let me uh, thank the panelists for some uh, great comments. <laughs>